please welcome back the AGS chairman, Chris Tucker. All right. So if everybody could have a seat, we're going to do another round of lightning talks. Um, uh, for those of you who may have gotten stuck in the uh, weather yesterday and didn't, didn't see, didn't get here in time, uh, we have, how many do we have this today, five? We have five speakers, um, so we won't go the full hour. And everybody's five minutes. All the slides are on auto advance. We'll see how they do, but we will, we will all, we will give all of them a warm, embracing family hug with a beautiful round of applause when they're done, okay? Um, so with that, we're gonna have our first speaker in from Arizona State University. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jacob Betham, PhD candidate from ASU School of Sustainability. I wanna thank AGS for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. I'll be talking about ethics and energy transitions. Uh, it may come as no surprise to you that energy transitions sometimes have negative social impacts. For instance, you may lose your job, you may lose your home, uh, you may lose your political voice. You, it may have come as a surprise to you unless you heard an earlier speaker say that much of uh, the US energy sources are found on Native American lands. Dramatic pause. Okay, in the next uh, series of images, there will be a set of maps showing you where the energy is in the US, and I'm highlighting a, an energy belt from Arizona up to North Dakota, and uh, keep your eye on that and see how much energy is in there. Here we've got uh, old energy types like coal, popular in Four Corners, and north in the Black Hills. Uranium is next, again in the Four Corners in Wyoming. About a third of uh, US uh, uranium is in the energy belt here. And lastly will be oil, here we go. And 18 of the uh, 100 largest uh, oil reserves in the US fall into the uh, energy belt as well. And so those three uh, fuel types represent the old energy types that we're moving away from. And next I'll be showing you some of the renewables that we're moving toward. So wind is the first one. You can see we have high wind speeds in the northern Great Plains. Next is solar, which is most abundant where I live in Arizona. And the last one will be shale gas, uh, which is uh, most abundant up in the uh, uh, North Dakota, up in the uh, shale play there. Okay, so we've got the old energy types, coal, uranium, and oil, and the new energy types, natural gas, wind, and solar, all on Native American land. And I didn't even show you the staple energies of uh, hydro, biofuels, and geothermal. And because of all the abundant energy there, uh, this is going to be uh, the communities that have the most to lose and also the most to gain. But we shouldn't think that just because uh, Native American cultures are a bit different from ours that it's just a lost cause to try to cooperate with them on the energy transition. So you see headlines like the one that was just displayed that give you the impression that we're just too far from one another. But what I'll be showing you today is comparing uh, so-called conventional Western energy uh, epic, ethical theories to uh, some of the tribal uh, ethical theories. So Ethics 101, Aristotle, Virtue Theory, you should act in moderation, don't do too much, don't do too little, and an action will show good character and human flourishing. Indigenous cultures also have a view of uh, virtue in their ethics. They adopt some of the cardinal virtues that Aristotle preaches, and they also have their own terms for good and bad character. But the difference is, is that Native American uh, virtue looks more like Nell Nodding's ethics of care. In this slide here, you can see Kantian's, uh, uh, Immanuel Kant's theory of duty ethics. It has three tests to make an action ethical. If you have good intentions, if your action is universalizable, and if it shows respect to all stakeholders. Uh, indigenous communities also understand duty, but their sense of duty uh, comes from uh, the, the land and from community, not from rationality as Kant sees it. Uh, and they also have strict uh, penalties for using someone for your own gain, which Kant would approve of. 
And the last of the big three is consequence-based ethics. This is essentially a cost-benefit analysis. Choose the action with the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And we see a bit of this in Native American culture, mostly the idea of uh, working towards the public good. Uh, we don't see quite as much uh, calculating in the quantitative way. Uh, and the Navajo, for instance, uh, seek win-win solutions rather than maximizing utility. So to wrap up, the lightning talk is to show you if we're going to work cooperatively with Native Americans, these are the ways that we would want to talk about ethical actions in terms of character and respect, in terms of collective good and care, and unethical ways of avoiding excess. And uh, that's all I've got for you today. So thanks a lot. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Bulmer Frontal, and I'm a researcher from the Czech Republic. And I would like to say a few words uh, today about uh, challenges and obstacles uh, connected with repowering wind farms in Central Europe. So repowering is uh, replacing of old wind turbines with uh, newer ones with higher capacity, or replacing parts of older wind turbines with uh, newer and more efficient technologies. Uh, there is a lot of benefits uh, connected with repowering. First of all, higher capacity and production from the same piece of land, uh, reuse of existing infrastructure, roads, and so on, second-hand turbine market, and other environmental aspects. And of course, uh, there is also expected higher local acceptance because the, uh, the turbines are already part of the landscape. Uh, they are perceived more uh, visually pleasing and less noisy. And it's expected that landowners and other stakeholders would like to keep uh, getting the revenues from wind farms. Uh, more than uh, 10 gigawatt hours uh, of uh, wind energy was installed between uh, 1995 and uh, 2000 in Europe, which should be in the next few years replaced or dismantled. Uh, in the Czech Republic, which is a small landlocked country in Central Europe, uh, the energy policy is still dominantly based on uh, fossil fuels and nuclear power with uh, only 10% of renewable energy sources uh, generating electricity and only 1% uh, from uh, wind energy. Uh, the realizable potential of wind energy in the country is uh, estimated for uh, about 2,500 2, uh, megawatts, while the installed capacity is so far only 310 megawatts. Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, almost 20% of uh, existing wind turbines are of the capacity lower than uh, 60, 600 kilowatts, and about half of all wind turbines existing are already older than 10 years. So there is a big potential for repowering, but it doesn't go so fast as expected. Uh, in our project, we made a research on uh, public attitudes and uh, barriers to future developments, particularly repowering projects, trying to identify the main barriers of uh, repowering projects. So first of all, uh, it's a lack of support schemes. Uh, each year, the feed-in tariffs are getting lower, and the last three years, there are no financial subsidies, no feed-in tariffs for no new wind energy projects. Uh, the second uh, aspect is there are new licensing procedures and a more strict uh, landscape protection limits. So on some places with old wind turbines, it's not possible to build new ones, and uh, these places will be free with dismantled turbines in the future. Uh, the third aspect is the access and uh, capacity of transmission grid, which is a problem especially for borderland areas where there is low capacity and uh, not so much access for new projects. Uh, the next uh, is the distributional and spatial injustice and opposition from neighboring communities, we, which in some cases live closer to existing wind farms but get no revenues from the projects, while the people who get the money are living more far away. And uh, also for some part of the people living uh, closer to existing wind farms, uh, there is a change of uh, perceptions to more negative ones. So wind turbines are getting more annoying for them after some years of existence with them. There is also a contextual negative effect. 
uh, of the boom of solar uh, power plants uh, between 2008 and 2010. And now the image of renewable energies is much worse, and it's uh, perceived as kind of speculative business of some investors. There is also a change of the local governments, as uh, sometimes the former local opponents of projects became mayors of municipalities now, and they are affecting public opinion against repowering projects. So it's another negative factor, and uh, some implications for future planning. So the government and politicians should propose more motivating support schemes for repowering projects, for example, like in Denmark, in the US and other countries, help uh, transmission operators to increase the capacity, and also ensure distributional justice. So uh, better divide the economic profit to surrounding communities and uh, consider higher visibility for larger distances. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, excuse my English. Good afternoon to everybody. My name is Enrique from here, Hunter College in New York, and today we are going to talk about uh, dam removals and climate change. As you know very well, hydropower has been crucial in the history of this country, from the first industrial concentration in Lowell, for instance, to the demonstration of AC in Niagara. Or during the 20th, during the 20th century, for instance, you have the federal government building the massive hydroelectric projects like Hoover, or Bonneville, etc. If you see here in the map, there was like a displacement, a, geog a geographical displacement from the east to the west uh, in the 20th century. As you are going to see now in the next slide, something new is happening. And what is this new? Dam removals. I know what you are thinking. Unthinkable. It is true. We are removing dams. But it is not something new. As you are going to see now in the next slide, this story started in the beginning of the 20th century, always, even during the Second World War. But during, since the 90s is when we have had the biggest concentration of dam removals. This is something unprecedented. It's really very important because we are removing many dams. This is a key example, the Edwards Dam. This is the first time in history that the uh, federal government forced the owner to remove a dam because of environmental issues. The first time in history. 1999. This is another example in Oregon, the marmot dam removal, very small hydroelectric plant, approximately 20 megawatts. And you can see how all of these dams are concentrated, especially in the Pacific Northwest. The next one is going to be the Condit Dam, the second largest dam removal project in history. Again, approximately 20, 25 megawatts. And interestingly, this power is already replaced uh, in the Pacific Northwest. No? The next example is the key example in history. It's the largest dam removal project in history that I participated there. This is why I know relatively well. The federal government removed two large dams in the Elwa River in the Pacific Northwest. And this is key for the future. Even if the uh, San Clemente Dam is not a hydroelectric dam, but it is reflecting the current tendency that we are experiencing. This is the largest dam removal project in the history of California. This is going to be massive. Pay attention, please, in 2020. Two dams, excuse me, four dams, 170 megawatts. If this is happening, this is going to be open, perhaps, for the massive uh, dams to be large. This is a very controversial project that I don't know if you know. It's the four dams in the lower Snake River. If that happens, this is going to be something incredible in our history. More than 1,000 megawatts of power there uh, here in the, in the Snake River. And these are the main causes why we are removing dams, mainly because they are old or because of it is more expensive for the owner to repair or to maintain or for river restoration, for instance, salmon, uh, water quality, recreation. This is really part of my argument. Unprecedented weather conditions, as some of you say in this conference, connected to climate change. And how this is related to the dam infrastructure. This is going to be very important now. You remember this case. In February 2017, the tallest dam in the country, no in, yes, in the country, correct, Oroville, was very close to collapse. 200,000 people had to be evacuated. 
Or more example, for instance, the, and I apologize for the pronunciation, Wataka, whatever, honestly. Wakatamadan in Puerto Rico, you know, with the Hurricane Maria almost collapsed, or in uh, Houston, Texas, the fourth biggest city in the country. No? This is really a key question here. What is the significance of these extreme weather events associated to climate change in terms of uh, dam removals and in terms of dam infrastructure? As you are going to see now, it's crucial. If you pay attention to all of these graphs, we have a very old dam infrastructure. By 2020, more than 80% of the dams are going to be old. And also, some states even don't have inspectors, like Alabama, for instance. There is another important example that can happen in the future, some of you from Arizona. Glen Canyon and the Hoover Dam. There are plans to combine everything in the Hoover Dam and to remove the Glen Canyon, to concentrate all of the hydropower. And concluding this, my argument, my argument is, because of climate change, we are going to see more stress in the infrastructure dams. You are going to see more dam removals in the future. And unfortunately, our government is not paying incredible money for this. Thank you very much. Evening. My name is Eric Lytak, and this is uh, place-based bioenergy. I'm making it a little bit narrower here. This is about a single species, namely Fraxinus, or ash, more colloquially. I'm from Montclair State University with CSAC, and we're going to be discussing its potential, well, as salvage. Now, ash is under threat of a pretty pernicious uh, pest, EAB. It's, um, well, it kills a tree within a couple of years here, and there's no real way to control it. It spreads very quickly, and so this is a pretty bad, but it's a great potential for bioenergy. Salvage is booming, especially in areas of Canada and the rest, so there's no reason why we can't salvage here as well. Uh, ash is very high energy density. There's quite uh, uh, the potential for producing forest loads of firewood, expanding the green energy sector, and well, making the woodlands more usable in future. Now, the reason why this is important beyond just EAB, the lower right corner here, is three other pests just off the top of my head. Uh, Asian longhorn beetle threatens all the maple species. Lanternfly, well, orchards are gone. And you've got pine beetle, which is lodgepole pine most of the north. And here we can see maple, uh, Alianthus, which is the host for lanternfly, uh, lodgepole pine, as well as ash trees, that hardwood timber that we're going to be talking just a little bit more about. This is the distribution of ash in New Jersey based on a 250 meter uh, MODIS data set. This is particularly white ash, uh, Fraxinus americana, which has a maximum density of around 50 meter squared base layer. There are four other species here as well, black, blue, green, and Carolina, uh, though the only two that are any noticeable quantities are uh, black and green. The basal area, by the way, is the cross-sectional area of the trunk. So this is the combined uh, map of that. So as we can see, the, again, the highest basal area is around 50 meters square per hectare. And there's about 1.8 million uh, available meters. Now that can be translated into board feet at around uh, 22 million or so, uh, and cubic feet, uh, well, it ends up being around 22 million um, BTUs, million BTUs. Now, so looking for actually mapping that for bioenergy. Uh, so this map shows a, a both currently operating bioenergy plants. Most of these are waste to energy plants as well as uh, coal plants. This one now is now including a timber uh, plants as well, any sort of uh, wood producers that are already handling diseased ash timbers uh, from the infestation that's spread across most of North Jersey at this point. So what we're looking at doing is tracing how we actually harvest that timber and take it from where it is to where it needs to be to actually be made use of. Most of the timber is already going to firewood, so there's no choice, no reason not to make it a little bit more uh, socially beneficial. Now looking at a uh, three plant scenario. What we're looking at here is that as the distribution of ash is mostly focused toward the north, you also see that uh, ideal plants for actually processing it also cluster toward the north when you weight the 
uh, analysis toward mm, the amount of basal area on the land and the amount of empty space. But if you only have three, you're essentially 450,000 or more meters square. So it makes more sense to have a few more plants. This is more of an extreme case. You have 10 processing facilities. Uh, but there's an issue here as well where especially the ones in the southern area do not have good access. Unfortunately, that's the, there's potential for bioenergy down there. But that area is no, known as the pine lands to all of you locals. I'm sure you know that. Uh, and there isn't really any hardwood there, mostly softwood pine, which is not near as energy dense as this species. However, this is, timing is incredibly important with uh, this sort of species. So we can't just go out and say, we're gonna cut this all at once. This relates to another aspect of my research where I'm looking at modeling the spread of these pests to make it a little bit better, as well as taking into account the costs associated, unfortunately, with uh, urban trees, especially green ash, which is very popular. Uh, that they have much higher removal costs and much lower uh, recoup rates. But again, there's no shortage. Even if I run out of time working on this problem, uh, due to trade and international agreements, we're looking at this being a problem for, well, the foreseeable future from this, that, and the other thing. And that's it. Here, I've been traveling the country studying and documenting the American energy sector with my project photojournalistic series Electric America. This was sponsored by the Shapiro Traveling Fellowship at the George Washington University. So today I want to talk to you about two case studies, one's offshore wind and the other is utility scale solar. This is the island of Block Island in Rhode Island. It's just off the coast of uh, Rhode Island and um, there are about a thousand residents that live there year-round and around 12,000 that live there during the summertime. For the last 92 years, the island has been powered by diesel. As of 2017, the first operational wind farm in the United States started spinning and providing offshore wind to Block Island and then to the mainland of Rhode Island. This has provided crazy amazing benefits to the residents of Block Island. Um, one of the key benefits of the project is the connection to the mainland. Prior to connecting to the mainland, um, the residents had to poor quality, unreliable electricity that was tied to the world price of oil. Block Island was importing about a million gallons of oil per year just to serve the small island. After switching to offshore wind and being able to connect to the mainland via an underwater sea to shore cable, they now receive stable electricity, high quality electricity, and contribute to uh, the state's renewable energy goals. So this was a really awesome project to see up close and personal. As you can see, I was able to ride with um, the people who maintain the turbines and get a very close look. Um, obviously, it's also changed the physical geography of the landscape, but I attest, and based on my research, um, that it brought a lot of key benefits to the community. Another place where we've seen changes in the electricity landscape and the way that we we're producing electricity was on the island of Kauai. Kauai Island Utility Cooperative and Tesla jointly uh, in 2016 started this uh, battery and solar facility, and it uh, now provides about 30 megawatts of power, sorry, 13 megawatts of power to the island of Kauai. Obviously, again, a dramatic change in the landscape um, of the island. However, I saw a great benefit to the agricultural communities uh, that live on the island. So, one of the key challenges of maintaining an operational utility scale solar farm is maintaining vegetation on the island, all of those unruly plants. And one way that local agricultural communities have tapped into these solar markets is by raising sheep that maintain the landscape. This is something that I saw not just in Kauai, but in North Carolina, in New Jersey, and other parts of the country. This is Daryl Kaneshiro. He is a local farmer, rancher, part of the community for 150 years, his family has been ranching. With the offset of this solar boom, he is now providing services for solar contracts for four solar farms on the island. This is the primary source of income for his family, and it has allowed him to expand his ranch and invest in agricultural tourism, among other things. 
In Canada, North Carolina, this is, uh, there's also a lot of utility scale solar. North Carolina is number two in the country in terms of solar installed capacity. I was able to visit a couple farms out there, um, one of which uh, is this one. And as you'll see on the back side of these panels, you have some unruly plants that compromise uh, solar capacity and also provide shade if they're not properly maintained. One thing that I saw in North Carolina was a lot of farmers that were interested in solar uh, servicing these massive solar farms. So this has 465,000 panels on it. It's an 80 megawatt farm in the eastern part of North Carolina. These are the types of, um, of farms that local agriculture suppliers and ranchers are interested in um, servicing. So in response to that, um, a bunch of farmers got together and created sun-raised farm networks. This is a network of um, agricultural communities in North Carolina that has, was established in 2012 specifically to service solar farms, specifically. Now, they don't always use sheep, but that is one primary resource. And what it's able to do is support these local um, agriculture suppliers and allow them to also invest in sheep as a new crop. One of the farmers that I spoke to spoke about investing half a million dollars in sheep in raising a bunch of ooze, ooze. Um, and it, he's hoping that in the long term it will help diversify his um, supply. So looking down on the future of energy, are we going to continue to see benefits for offshore wind and utility scale solar? I certainly hope so. Um, we're seeing this with new development in New Jersey, New York, Virginia, Delaware, um, and I really hope that continues to serve the communities around it. So this was just a taste of my journey. Um, you can read more on smithsonian.com and also the American Wind Energy Association's blog or on Facebook, or you can talk to me after. Thank you.